Can you tell us more about the resumption of your anonymous activities? As I said, Russia invaded Ukraine a few days after I returned from the New York City. Personally, uh, both from my experience of analyzing social changes in Russia and from my experience of the international journalism, I accepted the possibility of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. But it still seemed close to impossible because of its insanity. In fact, a lot of people thought so. A lot of people, but nevertheless, this madness happened on the 24th of February, 2022. And I was the only one from my social circle who was ready for it and knew what to do. How have people around you reacted to that? The thing is that I have been urging my acquaintances and friends to get travel documents for several years at least. And right after the 24th of February, I spent weeks and months urging my acquaintances and friends to buy tickets and leave Russia. I described the most possible series of events after the invasion to them, which came true in the future. But all of my friends and acquaintances started to tear the hair out of their heads only after all the tickets for trains and planes began to sell out at a crazy speed. And guess who spent days and nights with them to help them with finding and paying for tickets to Armenia? I will tell you even more. Some of them did not learn from their first mistakes and went back to Russia despite me almost begging them not to do that because of the high probability of mobilization. And a couple of weeks later, all of them were tearing their hair out again, urgently moving to Kazakhstan. Do you remember how you felt during the first week after the invasion? During the first week after Russia's invasion to Ukraine, events were happening so rapidly that I started updating my newsfeed every 10-15 minutes from morning until late night. A, a psychological shift happened inside me. Then all of that began to get reflected in nightmares, in my dreams. And I thought for a long time about whether I could mentally endure spreading materials about the invasion or not. But considering the tragedy happening in front of us, I decided to resume my anonymous journalistic activities for the last time. And it was this last job that was the most psychologically difficult for me during my whole career because addressing citizens in the form of historical lectures, war censorship, Mariupol, Bucha, treatment of war prisoners, treatment of civilians in Ukraine, bombing of houses, abuse, torture, rape, shootings, treatment of their own soldiers, transfer of conscripts to the front, constant claims to use nuclear weapons, testimony of Russian war prisoners about conditions in the army, absolutely wild and rough disinformation, barbarian schizophrenia on political talk shows, torn adults and children from rocket attacks, destroyed hospitals and houses, and Ukrainian cities practically wiped out from the face of the earth. I've seen original and independently verified photo and video evidences of all these events, and I cannot imagine what the soldiers and civilians in Ukraine went through and are going through. Just as it is frightening to imagine what the military 
conscripts and the mobilized ones who sincerely did not want and do not want to go to Ukraine as soldiers have gone through and are going through. Has information propaganda changed since the invasion? After the invasion, animal propaganda began to gain unbelievable heights from both sides. Of course, it existed before the Russian invasion of Ukraine on both ends, but it was after the 24th of February when the propaganda reached a new level, both from ordinary people and bot owners in social networks and from politicians in Russia, Ukraine and European Union countries. In fact, a full war also began on the information battlefields. Are you equating all sides of the conflict? No, I do not. Because there cannot be any equality between these sides. It was not a Ukraine that invaded another country's land. It is not Ukraine that has occupied the territories of another independent country. It is not Ukraine that has bombed entire cities to the ground. It is not Ukraine that has killed and maimed millions of Ukrainians. It is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, not Ukraine's invasion of Russia. And it is primarily Russian society that is responsible for addressing the root causes of this catastrophe. But I have studied the picture very well on all the popular Russian and foreign resources from the other side as well. And I am able to highlight several very important points. In addition to the positive points and public figures, which of course we also have. First, the most psychologically vulnerable and misinformed side of this conflict is an average citizen of Russia, Ukraine, Europe, the West, any country. If we take Russia and Ukraine in particular, the methods of this information war applied to these sites are partially the same and the reaction of Russian and Ukrainian ordinary people is mostly the same. Both sides accept everything their local propagandists tell them. It is very easy to get both of these sites emotional, for example, by showing fake news summaries or even fake screenshots of enemy comments from social media. Both of these parties fail to notice, and some of them deliberately fail to notice the impact of both local propaganda and the social media information bubble on their thinking. Both of these sites in this information war are nothing but tools for scums who exploit their psychological vulnerabilities for the profit. And both of these sites suffer the most from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Second, some propagandists from Ukraine try to broadcast simple and understandable answers in which they sometimes do not believe themselves. For example, that almost all Russians support the invasion, that virtually all Russians support Putin's regime, that Russians never really fought for their freedom after Putin's arrival, that the Russian mentality is almost like a slave mentality, that Russian history and culture is toxic and saturated with imperialism, that there is an equal sign between the possibility of a regime change in Ukraine and the possibility of regime change in Putin's Russia, that Russians and only Russians are to blame for what happened, and so on and so forth. And more often than not, this propagandists do not represent the interests of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people in their deliberate disinformation, they pursue their own and their partner's benefit. 
as long as the majority of the population believes that the propagandists represent the interests of their own country, this propaganda will lead to devastating long-term consequences again and again. Third, there are so many propagandists in Russia. They are so heavily sponsored by the Putin's regime, and they form such a large foundation for that regime's existence that propagandists in Russia broadcast understandable answers to any audience. There is literally everything from the mass thrown off contradictory statements like the not everything is so definite statement to the animal hatred affecting the darkest sides of a human. It is not necessary to list each of their methods separately now, so we can simply say that propaganda in Russia uses all methods of the information war. Those responsible for propaganda in Russia are not stupid people, and they receive unbelievable amounts of money for their atrocities. They should not be taken lightly. These people are just as responsible for the invasion and war horrors as the politicians of Putin's regime. Fourth, even this information war shows who is who of some of the so-called opinion leaders from Russia who have moved abroad. Hypocritical, eloquent propagandists who first helped to build Putin's regime and enjoyed its patronage, and then, after receiving patronage from the other side, began to use their language to trample the dirt on their own peaceful Russian citizens and call for, as an example, targeting Russian soldiers with missiles. Some of the representative of opposition foundations who know that they are far away from war tyranny themselves, but still inviting people to their Russian headquarters and calling for mass rallies after repeated leaks on their web servers. Even though they are possible activists and today's Russia could go to prison for several years because of it. Many of the Russian artists who cowardly turn a blind eye to the madness going on in Russia in the hope that it will not affect them or that they will have time to leave Russia when it comes for them. Or more than that, those artists who are ready to please any government with their tongue and who receive bloodstained money for their performances at pro-government Russian concerts during this time. Some of the opposition public figures who conduct their live shows in the spirit of Russian federal political talk shows, but under a liberal, in quotes, sauce. Those who simply refuse to admit their mistakes, instead pouring slop on those making fair observations. Some of the businessmen who first enjoyed the patronage of Putin's regime in establishing their companies, and then, when it became unprofitable for them personally, began to renounce their Russian citizenship with pride, began defiantly separating themselves from their former compatriots on every possible occasion, and began to pour verbal slop at those with whom they only recently worked side by side in their projects, to whom they confessed an eternal friendship and devotion, with whom they lived under one roof, with whom they grew up together since childhood. And as long as there is no functioning institution of reputation in Russia, more and more of these opinion leaders from Russia will emerge, and they will not continue to bear responsibility for what they have done, are doing, and will continue to do. And 
fifth. <laughs> Many of the populist politicians from countries with European values, they do not represent their interests, even of their fellow citizens at all. They simply hypocritically play on the feelings of their electorate, deliberately forgetting that right now they continue to buy record amounts of natural resources from Russia, deliberately forgetting that they have put their countries and their fellow citizens in direct economic dependence on Russian gas and oil themselves, deliberately forgetting that they, despite the 2014 ban, supplied Russia with bombs, missiles, planes, and other equipment themselves until at least 2020, deliberately forgetting when Russian civil society was getting destroyed by Putin's regime and prisons were filled with packed peaceful protesters, deliberately forgetting how many of them, in fact, did not want to lose their political and business partnerships with representatives of Putin's regime and their behind-the-scenes games deliberately forgetting how easily they forgave the annexation of Crimea by Russia and how time after time they untied Putin's hands with their soft outrages, deliberately forgetting what accusations of collective guilt on the basis of nationality led to in the first half of the 20th century deliberately forgetting that there cannot be first-class refugees and second-class refugees for politicians representing real European values, and finally, deliberately forgetting that they are also responsible for the establishment and consolidation of Putin's regime, no matter how much they would like to hide this fact away. Do not let yourself be fooled. These populist politicians are not the party of good and justice. With their hatred and ethnic mockery, many of them only help Putin's propaganda in strengthening their influence on the psychologically vulnerable and misinformed Russians. And this has direct consequences for Ukrainians and even for citizens of the European Union itself. The family members and children of populist politicians do not lie in the trenches and die from airstrikes and wounds, as do the family members and children of ordinary people in Ukraine and Russia. These politicians are well aware that they are safe and that they have little to lose, even in the worst of circumstances, because of their reckless speeches and actions. It is the simple people of Ukraine, Russia, Europe, and the West who pay the price, the simple people of the whole world. And if these populist politicians do not take full responsibility for their speeches and actions, it will happen again and again again and again, again and again. I want to highlight this separately, though. I do not put any mark on the people I'm talking about right now. I'm sincerely grateful to these people for all the good that they have already done for society, and I sincerely believe that these people if they really want it, are capable both of admitting their mistakes and misconceptions and capable of using their influence for the good of society and all people on earth. And personally, I will only support them and all of that, but at the same time, I do not want to and will not gloss over the delusions and crimes that I see in front of my eyes. Do you think you understand the reasons for the current attitude of a large part of the Ukrainian population towards Russians? I think that they are understandable, yeah. This attitude does not make me angry or resentful. 
it would be at least strange for me to be offended by people who face real horror and death on a daily basis because of the actions of the Russian government. But I neither share nor support this attitude. More than that, I am convinced that the persistence and maintenance of this attitude towards Russians on the basis of nationality may have devastating consequences, both for Ukrainians themselves with Russians and for relations between nations in general in the long run. We are already a few steps away from an international catastrophe. It is like the world has returned to the 20th century and wants to repeat its mistakes. We must do everything possible to prevent this. Do you think you have the right to express your opinion on this subject by being a person from Russia? Yes, I do. And why, in fact, does it matter where I was born and what is my nationality in my case? Personally, I have never lost sympathy for the Ukrainian people in my life, and I have an interest and respect for their history and independence as a country. Personally, I have always actively fought against anti-Ukrainian propaganda since 2014 on all levels, even at the university since my first year there. Personally, I regularly made donations to both Ukrainian civilians and refugees from Ukraine after the 24th of February. Personally, I have donated educational and informational assistance via the internet to Ukrainian refugees who came to the United States. So my conscience is clear and I have never done it for my ego and my anonymous activity over the past three years only confirms it. Tell us, how did you perceive the announcement of mobilization in Russia? When mobilization was announced in Russia on the 21st of September 2022, I realized that all my predictions after the invasion had come true. I had been urging my acquaintances and friends for days not to return to Russia and to remain outside the country, at least until the end of the war battles. They heard me, but they did not listen to me. And I realized it only afterwards, that this was almost always the case. My, my help was not traded with the same attention it deserved. And unfortunately, I did not understand all of that right away. All of my acquaintances and friends returned to Russia shortly before the mobilization was announced. And guess who started to tear the hair out of their heads again and started to hurry to leave Russia by any means possible across the border with Kazakhstan? after the 21st of September. And the mobilization in Russia itself has shown shows and will continue to show which disasters the usurpation of power in Russia leads to on all levels. How hypocritical the mocking populist politician from the countries with European values can be showing the world community how exactly some of them support that. There are no illegal people statement. How important the help of ordinary people from Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan and other countries can be for Russians fleeing from death. How important the help of ordinary people from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, the Czech Republic, and other countries can be for Ukrainians fleeing from death. And how much grief awaits hundreds of thousands of Russian families after the mass return of the first sink 
coffins. What did you feel from the beginning of the invasion until the end of your anonymous activities? Close analysis and work with what was going on since the 24th of February caused me a deep depression at the end and a strong feeling that all my efforts and aspirations to change the social life for the better in Russia and in the world were simply useless. Now, of course, I realize that this is not true because I know how much of a positive impact I brought with my work, but it's one thing to say it now and another thing to say to my former self. Um, I ended my international journalism on the 15th of June, 2022, and on the 19th of June, I attended a protest in Philadelphia in support of Ukrainian and Russian refugees, but considering what they published in their community afterwards, I decided not to attend their future events. Then I intentionally edited an amateur video of reporting English and Russian about the protest, and then I posted it in two versions on the 27th of June on the international resource called YouTube, the Russian resource called T-Journal, and the English resource called Reddit. And after that, I took a pause to formulate my thoughts about what has been happening in Russia for three years. And now you finally see the result of all of this.